Hi everybody, welcome to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman and tonight we're going to be talking about the book of Genesis as foundation. And this is going to be part one of that study. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study how to interpret scripture. Guide us, Lord, in our understanding that we may draw and arrive at right conclusions um, and be uh, guided by your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this week we're studying uh, Genesis as foundation and we're in part one of that study. And I'd like us to take a look at uh, John chapter one, uh, verses one to four. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of all, uh, sorry, of, of men. <clears throat> so, in relaying to us the uh, creation account, the Bible is pretty straightforward with how mankind uh, was brought into existence and, and with how all things were brought into existence. The Bible does not debate the, the existence of God. It's, it takes it um, as a matter of fact. Uh, and in fact, when we look at Genesis chapter 1, <clears throat> the very first words that Scripture um, starts out with are, In the beginning, God. And so that tells us that um, it makes no apologies for its creationist approach um, to uh, you know how the world was came into being um, and so it was God who created all things and set all things in motion uh, so let's take a look at um, Genesis chapter 1 I'm going to look at the entire verse um, this time in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters so from the very beginning of the Bible, the very first words of the Bible, God, um, the Bible points out to us that God created all things from nothing. So, and remember, when we compare that with the other text that we read from John chapter 1, talking about the involvement of the word in the, in the creation process, we see that all things that were made were made through the word. And later on, by verse 14, the word is identified as Jesus Christ. Um, and so... He was, he was involved in making every single thing that was made without him, nothing was made that was made. Now, when we compare that with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that it's God that made and created all things in heaven and, uh, and the earth. Sorry, he, he created both heaven and earth and all things, of course, that were in them. So, um, according to the Bible, everything was created uh, in this first creation week. And so God created everything from nothing, uh, speaking into existence or calling into existence that which uh, came into being. And what's also interesting is that the, uh, I believe in the original language, um, the, 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 the word there uh, used for heavens is actually plural. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So there's actually, according to scripture, three heavens. You have, uh, of course, the sky, which we call heaven. Uh, you have uh, the outer space heaven. And then, of course, there's the third heaven. Uh, where it said that God is is uh, is said to have, is is said to dwell. Um, actually, I should probably give you the text for that. Uh, you got Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse two. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago. Sorry, yeah, above fourteen years ago. Whether in in body I cannot tell, or whether uh, out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a, a one caught up to the third heaven. Then there's Revelation eight ten. Um, no, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation, no, no, I'm sorry, that was the only text, so uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, so it points out that um, this individual is caught up to the third heaven, uh, which implies that there are uh, three, so you have the first heaven, which is the sky, uh, second he heaven would be like outer space, and then you have the third heaven where God dwells. So, the greatest questions of philosophy regarding who we are, why we are, and how we got here are all answered in the first sentence of the Bible when it says, in the beginning, God. Uh, and of course, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, so the question of, of who we are, well, we're, we're, we are created beings made in the image of God. Um, why? Well, because God created us. Uh, how? He spoke us, in, uh, well, he spoke most of the world into existence, but from what he spoke into existence, uh, after the earth itself was created, he took the dust of the ground and breathed into, and formed it into a body, and then breathed into that body's uh, nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Um, so all of life's uh, philosophical questions are actually answered 
in Scripture in regard to human origins. Um, we exist because God created us at a definite time in the past. Um, so we didn't evolve out of nothing, uh, nor did we come into existence by chance. So in order to have evolutionary process, you have to have something that evolves into something else. Um, you can't have nothing evolve into something that doesn't, um, you know, that, that defies uh, the evolutionary um, principle or, or, or perspective. Um, and so since we learned that in the very beginning there was nothing, and then from that nothing God made something, um, it, it contradicts and does not square with uh, the, the ideas of scientists who, who uh, uh, believe in evolution. Um, so God created and brought all things into existence from nothing. Uh, and so the evolutionary theory breaks down because you can keep going far back, far back, far back, um, you know, and, and looking at what could have evolved into something else. But eventually you get to, I guess, you know, single cell organisms or maybe like the amoeba. And then the question becomes, well, where did that come from? So at some point in tracing things back, uh, if one wants to approach things from an evolutionary standpoint, you're going to arrive at nothing because everything has to come from something. And once you get to the point where, where you're at nothing, so like, you know, if you want to uh, trace it all the way back and, 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 and uh, you wind up with single cell organisms and then well, where do they come from? Uh, so in order to have uh, life, you have to have something that would evolve into life because you can't have nothing evolve into something. And so that's the problem with evolutionary theory. It can't account for the very origins of life. Um, <clears throat> now, on the other hand, the Bible, the Bible's perspective doesn't have that problem because it tells us in the beginning there was nothing and from nothing, God made everything. So Darwinian evolution is contradictory to scripture in every way and attempts by, by uh, and there are some people who attempt to harmonize it with the Bible and make, uh, and make Christians, and they make Christians look silly. Uh, because really the two accounts don't square together. You know, they, 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 they're not in agreement. They're in contradiction to one another. Um, <clears throat> and Darwin himself said that if it could be shown that something was highly complex to the point where it could not be broken down uh, and, and to have evolved from uh, smaller components or smaller uh, uh, things that could have um, gone through a process of, of variation or gone through a process of natural selection and evolved into something greater. If you had something that, that could not be broken down where one single thing removed would prevent that thing from, from working, um, then uh, his theory would break down. Darwin actually admitted that. Um, and what's also interesting is that uh, you have something like the, the eye or, or the uh, flagellar motor, for example, and those things are irreducibly complex, meaning that they cannot be broken down uh, into smaller components that could evolve into a much larger component. They have to be taken as is, because if you remove one thing from the equation, uh, the, the, um, the organism or, or the item would cease to work. And once it's, it doesn't work, it's not functional and therefore defies natural selection. Um, so the idea that people can square Darwin's evolutionary theory with their Christian beliefs is really uh, absurd. It, it, those two things cannot be squared because they're in direct opposition to, e to each other. One person is saying that uh, things evolve from something else through a process of millions of years. And the Bible is teaching that God created the world in six literal days. And uh, not only did he create the world, but he created it from nothing. So according to scripture, we were created by God at an absolute point in time. And scripture tells us that point in time in, the, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning. So God existed prior to this beginning. And God existed before time was created and expressed in the daily cycle of evening and morning and months and in the years, all marked by the relationship of the world to the sun and the moon. So this absolute beginning is echoed and supported by other passages of scripture, which continually reaffirm the, na the nature and means of God's creative work. So here's what I mean by that. If we take a look at how time was created, uh, the Bible says, uh, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. 
and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the day, the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So we reckon a day according to, uh, well, biblically, uh, we today reckon the day according to 24 hours, but we, there's a daylight portion of the day and then there's the evening or night portion of the day. Uh, but biblically speaking, the e there's evening and then there's morning, right? You had the light part of the day, you had the day part of the day. So that cycle of light and darkness uh, is considered a day. And it's really the same thing as how we, uh, it's slightly different from how we ca calculate time, but it's still the same 24 hour concept. Uh, you have light and you have darkness. You have day, you have night. Uh, and the 24 hour period of light and darkness is called a day. Uh, the only difference between uh, the biblical account and how we how we uh, calculate time today would be that today we consider a new day to start at 12 o'clock in the morning, whereas biblically, uh, the the from evening to evening started another day. So you'd have the evening portion of the day, then you'd have the daylight portion of the day, and then once it began to even, once the evening started, then it was beginning the new portion of the day. Um, but still it would be a 24 hour period. It's just that the starting point of that 24 hour period biblically begins the evening. Uh, so the evening begins a new day. Uh, whereas um, for us today, we calculate time by 12 in the morning. <clears throat> so anyway, the point is uh, that God created time through uh, the, the very first day where he created light and darkness. The setting apart of light and darkness created the concept of time of of of, a, of the day, uh, and then from there, what's interesting is that um, he also creates the stars, the moon, the sun, uh, and these were to be lights that were put in the firmament. And let's take a look at that at that particular verse for a moment. I'm going to skip some of the other days of creation, uh, and we're going to skip down to. Um, verse fourteen, where it says, "And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night." and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. So you get days, years, um, seasons, all these things are created in relation to the stars, the moon, and uh, of course the sun. And, and uh, as we saw in, in the first uh, couple of verses, uh, the daylight portion of the day and the evening portion of the day. And today, uh, you know, it, it pretty much is the same thing where um, <clears throat> the time is reckoned based on uh, the stars and, the, and seasons are, are reckoned that way as well, um, are reckoned by, uh, by, by the stars, the moon, and, and by uh, the sun. Um, so, you know, without the sun, if we could never see the sun, uh, if all of our clocks stopped working temporarily, um, it would be really hard to tell um, what time it is. OK, uh, before the before clocks were invented, we had the use of, uh, I think, what was called the sundial. And based on the angle in which the sun hit the sundial, you could tell what time of day it was. Now, with electronics, assuming that they're that they're working and that there's no lapse in power, um, you can tell time without having to actually look up at the sky. Uh, but the problem with that is, let's say if we didn't have the sun, if you were locked into a, you know, maybe in like a cube room with no windows and you had to tell time. Um, could you guarantee that um, there was no lapse in, in power, there was no uh, error, uh, something that, that, that could have caused your device not to calculate properly, and therefore uh, you could have the wrong time? The only way that you can really know the right time is by looking up at the stars and, and, and being able to, to measure. Otherwise, um, your calculation could be put off. But of course, you know, with our watches and time and, and so forth today, uh, we've pretty much synced those things so that what you see when you look at your cell phone or, or a watch or a clock is pretty much what you would see when you look up at the sky. Um, so that being said, uh, the, the real point here is that God created time uh, during this creation week when he created these lights uh, that were to be in the sky. And so if time was created during the creation week and God existed prior to the creation week, because remember God is from everlasting and to everlasting, then God existed even before he created time. So God essentially is a being not bound by time. Uh, he, he, uh, he existed even before he created time. So time was created for us, for his, for his created beings. Let's take a look again at uh, John chapter one, verse one to three. 
The Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. Now we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times in time past unto, unto the fathers by, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Jesus was the agent of creation. He loved what he made and, and, and loved it so greatly that he was willing to die for his creation. So, uh, you know, even when we look at the, when we compare the Genesis account with, along with the um, with the uh, John chapter one account, we learn that Jesus was with the father and created all things. God was certainly present at creation. And of course, uh, in Genesis chapter one, uh, verse two, it tells us that, uh, that the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So the Holy Spirit was present in creation in creation as well. So you have the entire Godhead present in creation that took part in the creation uh, of all things. Um, <clears throat> and also when it talks about God creating, uh, the term Elohim is used in Genesis, which implies plural. So all three members of the Godhead were present and took part in the creation story. Um, now, I couldn't break down for you exactly what each person did. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, I don't think we have all the answers about. But we do know uh, that the Father spoke. And according to what Hebrews tells us here, um, Hebrews uh, verse uh, chapter 1, verse 2 tells us um, that the Son was whom he hath appointed heir of all things by also by whom also he made the worlds. So apparently Jesus, um, in his uh, before he actually became Jesus, when he was in the form of the Word, who uh, and and and, and uh, as Philippians says, who was in the form of God uh, and was equal with God, um, the Word um, was was essentially the agent by which God created all things. And so when we factor in that Jesus is our Creator, um. The fact that he went to the cross to die for us is significant because it shows us that we serve a God who loves us enough where, his, where, where he values us uh, even more than he values his own life. He essentially, I mean, if you, if you think about the idea of God going to the cross, then you have to say to yourself, you know, God is essentially saying, I don't want to be God and live forever unless I can live with you. So that's the kind of sacrifice that Jesus was willing to make uh, that's the sacrifice that he made for us. So I think it's also significant that when we look at the Genesis account, that man was made in the image of God. We were made to resemble God. And so we were made special and with a purpose rather than as a product of chance and evolutionary forces. So it shows that we have value in the eyes of God, both in creation and, of course, in the fact that Jesus went to the cross. Now let's take a look at the uh, days of creation. Then I'm going to go ahead and grab a, uh, grab a comment that's coming in. Uh, if we look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, uh, we were sharing a little bit about that before, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail now. In Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 1 to 3, uh, sorry, verse 3 to 5, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So when we look at, uh, now let's look at Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 8 to 11. The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt, shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in, that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, sorry, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So if we look at how the term day is used here, notice that the day is specifically identified as the evening and the morning, the night portion of the day, and then the daylight portion of the day, right? 
So a literal day is implied here in the Genesis account that God created the world in six literal days because he created the world in the evening portion and the daylight portion. And notice that uh, the terms evening and morning are singular. So in the original language, uh, as in the, the, uh, the English translation, the, uh, the, the words for evening and morning are singular. So he created the world uh, or, or, uh, in, in, in six periods of evenings and mornings, right? Uh, six periods of, of a single evening and a single morning. Uh, what's also interesting is the fact that when we look at what God created on day one, like, for example, when he created light, God created light in the evening and morning literal portion, uh, portions uh, uh, that, that combine to make a single day. So according to scripture, God created light in the literal um context of a day and then each thing was created on a literal evening and morning a literal day then when we look at the fourth commandment which talks about the sabbath it takes for granted that god created the world in six literal days of a week and therefore on the literal seventh day of every week uh they were to celebrate the sabbath which was a memorializing of uh, of creation and a time of special uh fellowship with god in which uh they would they would come together to worship the basis for the Sabbath is rooted and grounded in the Genesis creation account in which God created the world in six literal days, six literal evening and morning sessions, and then rested on the seventh literal evening and morning, blessed it that time, that period of time, and hallowed it. So days are determined by the light and, and uh, por the, the daylight portion of the day and the night portion of the day, and a cycle of, of a single evening and morning are a literal day. God created uh, 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 the world in, in literally six days, blessed the seventh day, and commanded the Israelites to keep the, the seventh day holy while working uh, the, the other six days of the week, just uh, just as God did. He, he created the world in six literal days and rested on the seventh. So there is no metaphor here. There is no figurative language used here. It's very literal in how it explains itself because the Israelites were to worship God on the, 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 the seventh day um, of the week, just as uh, just as God had, had worked for six days and rested on the literal seventh day. So one cannot actually keep the Sabbath unless you believe in a literal six-day creation week. Because in order to believe in a six-day creation week, um, you know, in order to celebrate the Sabbath, you have to believe that God rest, that God worked for six days, literally, and then rested on the seventh day. Otherwise, how could you calculate when to celebrate the Sabbath? You couldn't. Uh, because, you know, you'd have to make assumptions. You know, if the world was created in 6,000 days, then then we don't have to keep the Sabbath for another thousand years, assuming that we're in the 6,000 uh, year period. So again, it would be impossible to keep the Sabbath unless one believes in a six day creation week. Uh, and then God resting on the seventh day of that, of that creation week, blessing that seventh day and hallowing it. So the Sabbath actually shows that we believe in, in, in what God did literally on the creation. The other thing that's interesting is that uh, the word yam is used for day. That's the Hebrew, that's the, the word in the original language in the Hebrew. Uh, the term yam is used in Genesis chapter 1, and it's defined for us in Genesis chapter 1 as the evening and the morning. So there was evening, then there was morning. That makes up a yam or a day. Uh, so the term is used in a singular, not plural, uh, meaning meaning a single day. So this wasn't God created the world in days, but rather the evening and the morning were the first day. So it's not the evening and the morning were the first days. No, the evening and the morning were the first literal day. Uh, so day, is, day there is actually in the singular. So the seven days of creation are to be understood as a complete unit of time introduced by a cardinal number, Echad, one, followed by uh, ordinal numbers, second, third, fourth. So this pattern indicates a consecutive sequence of days culminating in the seventh day. So the sequence is, is a third thing that shows you that we're talking about literal days here because on day on the first day, evening in the morning, God created light. On the second day, uh, the evening in the morning, God created the firmament. The third day, the third day in the sequence, God created, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, land in the, the sea. Uh, so he created the the, uh, the land of the earth, and then he created the uh, the sea, 
um, gathering the waters together. Then on the fourth day, you have the moon, the stars, the sun, right? So you, ha and then the fifth day, you have the, um, um, the, the uh, birds and of course the, uh, the aquatic animals. Uh, then on the sixth day, you have um, land animals. And of course you have uh, Adam and Eve that were created on the sixth day. Uh, and then the seventh day was of course when God rested. So all of this shows us that God uh, created the world in a sequence of these evening and morning periods equating to six literal days. So the seven days of creation are to be understood as a complete unit uh, of time. Um, and the pattern of, of, of consecutive sequence, uh, sequence of days uh, culminates in the seventh day, uh, which, which is when they would, which is the day that God blessed and hallowed, making it the Sabbath. Also, uh, the literal nature of the day is taken for granted when God wrote uh, with his finger the fourth commandment. So remember that uh, the, the Ten Commandments were written with God's own finger. And so God said, for in six days, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Okay, so I made the world in six days. Rested on, and, and sorry, for six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, the seventh yom, wherefore, or that's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the basis for the seventh day Sabbath rests on the sequence of a literal seven day creation week. So create, God created the world in six days. Uh, so, and then the seventh day is, is, the, uh, is the day that was created for the Sabbath. So it's a creation week, seven, a period of seven days. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me on the program. Appreciate what you said about the creation week and the day and day and evening, and uh, the literal six day creation week and the seventh day holy and the being the Sabbath. And um, there's many ways I could go with this, but I've been studying my Bible and I looked in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. It says, "But you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself. I'm the Lord." So obviously God was in Levitical time God was still the same God as he is today God of the, you know some people say the God of the Old Testament is a God of judgment a God of wrath the God of the New Testament a God of grace but God of the great the God of grace that was in Jesus that that was the God that was graceful that which was Jesus in the New Testament was the God of grace in the Old Testament and the God of love in the Old Testament and um I just want to bring out this is the part about theistic evolution and uh, Leviticus chapter 19 verse 19 you shall keep my statutes you shall not let your livestock breed with another kind you shall not sow your field with mixed seed you shall nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you so obviously there was God wanted uh, the Israelites to keep the the kind separated like they're not supposed to mix two different closely related breeds together. And, and if we do this today, they, they, those two animals will become sterile. So they won't be able to continue their species. So you can see that to, uh, there's no intermediary species. There's no uh, in-between species. There's no, um, there, in, you, there's, no, there's no missing link, so to speak, in, in, in the evolutionary thought. But... And, um, there's no, there's no crop. If you and a lion, you're gonna be able to get us. You, you might get a liger, but you're not. There, that liger is gonna be sterile. So there's obviously God didn't want that to happen because He wanted every, every animal, every seed, everything to every created being to be with their own species, their own specific species. And so, um, God wanted not no crossbreeding in that regard. So. Uh, obviously that God wanted um, God wanted to preserve the race and it and you can't you can't switch species that, that which evolution talks about switching species from from a amoeba all the way to a monkey all the way to a human but you can't do that in 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 real life it's not possible thank you Andrew it seems like everything that God set in motion in creation uh, seems to be under attack today um, whether it be through evolution, through, uh, you know, other people's schools of thought or other religions. Um, you know, many people don't believe in the Sabbath, uh, let alone uh, many people, that, there are many people that don't believe in the literal creation week. Uh, so obviously, if you don't believe in the literal creation week, how could you believe in, in the Sabbath? Um, and it's interesting that when we look at 
um, this the, what what uh, we believe about creation, and we think about the third angel's message, uh, we can see why there's such great conflict, even especially now as it is today, because um, there's a recent papal encyclical on climate change that calls the Seventh Day Sabbath, quote unquote, the Jewish Sabbath. And encourages the world to observe a day of rest, not the day of rest, but a day of rest to alleviate global warming. And of course, by uh, by this, they're talk, they're they're referring to Sunday. Uh, so this was uh, written by Pope Francis, um, <clears throat> Laudato uh, Laudato Laudato uh Vatican City, Vatican Press, 2015, pages 172 to 173. Um, now, there's a few things I I I need to say about this about this point. First of all, um, the Sabbath is never referred to as the Jewish Sabbath. Um, you know, I mean, well, there are scriptures in the in the uh, in maybe in the New Testament that uh, would ref would refer to it uh, that way. However, the Sabbath has always been for all of humanity, and we know that because before there was a Jew, there was a Sabbath. Because remember, in in the Garden of Eden, God, um, you know, after God had made the, the 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 world in six days and rested on the seventh, Adam and Eve would have been keeping the Sabbath because God had blessed it hallowed it, sanctified it. So the Sabbath was meant, wasn't made for Jews because before there was a Jew, Adam and Eve were given the Sabbath and they were intended, and the Sabbath was intended for them to enjoy. So the Sabbath was made for man. And that's why Jesus could say the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, right? So the Sabbath has its purpose. It was created for human beings. But it was not created in, so that human beings could serve it, but rather it served a purpose for humanity. That was the point that Jesus was trying to make. Um, the other interesting point here is that while referring to the Sabbath as the Jewish Sabbath, because remember, Jesus kept the Sabbath, all the apostles kept the Sabbath. Uh, there have been people throughout history that have always kept the Sabbath. It is only a more recent thing in which the the, uh, the Roman church claims to have been able to change the solemnity of the Sabbath day from Sabbath to Sunday. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, the Bible predicts that this would take place. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25, it, was, it says, He will seek to change times and laws, and they will be given into his hand for a time, time, and the dividing of times. Um, <clears throat> so there would come a time in which someone uh, would seek to change the times, the set times that God put in motion, meaning the Sabbath, uh, and of course the law of God. And the Sabbath is both a uh, time that God established as well as a law of God. Uh, so the change of from Sabbath to Sunday was actually already predicted in scripture. Nevertheless, um, the Roman church, uh, particularly the, the Pope, uh, refers to the Sabbath, at, the seventh day Sabbath as the Jewish Sabbath, and then says that people all over the world in the interest of climate change should, should observe a day of rest. What did God command his people? God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, in order to keep something holy, it has to already be holy to begin with. So in other words, he didn't say, you will now make holy the Sabbath day, right? If that were the case, then it would have been a commandment only for the Jews because he, he was commanding the Jews to make the Sabbath a holy day. But that's not what he did, as he as he had done with the, with the, with the festivals and with the feast days uh, that you can see in Leviticus chapter 16, I think it is, or 23. Um, I believe it was 23, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, um, with the Sabbath, though, it was different. Instead of commanding them to make the Sabbath a holy day, he commanded them to keep or maintain it as a holy day, meaning that it was already holy long before the Jews were given this knowledge. So their job, as far as the fourth commandment was concerned, was to maintain something that was already set in motion since creation. That's why God said, uh, for in because for or because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, or that's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, in other words, God made the Sabbath holy and hallowed in the creation week on the seventh day. So, in Gen in the Genesis account in Genesis chapter um, two, when we read about how the Sabbath was created, and how, uh, it talks about how God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it. Right. So the Sabbath was made holy in creation. The commandment only requires people to recognize and to maintain that which has already been made holy for man in creation. So that's an important point. So the Pope has no right at all uh, to tell people to keep 
a day of rest when God has made uh, uh, and hallowed and blessed the day of rest. So there are three particular words that are used in reference to the Sabbath. First, God rested, he blessed it, and then he sanctified it. Uh, and to sanctify it means to, uh, to, uh, to make it holy. Um, so when keeping the Sabbath, we're not making the Sabbath a holy day. We're just simply recognizing something that God has already set in motion since the beginning of time. Now I'd like us to take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, because let's look at um, the Sabbath and creation in the context of prophecy. Revelation 14, verse 7 says, uh, actually, I'm going to start with verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So notice here that it uses the same language as the Genesis account and the same language really as the, as the Ten Commandments. Uh, because if we look, if we compare this particular part where it says, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to backtrack a little bit and let's look at the commandment. Okay, I'm going to just start at verse 11. For, or because, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea. So there you see again that pattern. Heaven, earth, water, right? In this case it says sea. Uh, the other case it says the fountains of waters. But in this, but either way it's using the same language. Uh, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea, sorry, and, uh, heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, or that's why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So it's, it's pointing us back to creation, just like Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, pointing us back to creation. Worship him who made heaven and earth and, and sea and the fountains of waters. Um, and so when we point, get pointed back to the creation week, we are reminded of the Sabbath because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And the only day, the only uh, evening and morning, the only 24-hour period of time, the only day that God blessed was the seventh day. So there are a lot of things that God blessed in creation. He, he blessed marriage, for instance. He blessed Ad, uh, Adam and Eve. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. Um, he uh, blessed, um, I think, his creation as well. Um, so there are many things in Scripture uh, which God blessed. Let me just go to the, uh, the book of Genesis because I want to read it verbatim. I don't want to, uh, to paraphrase. So if we look at... Um, when God started to create the animals, right? <clears throat> the Bible says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that, uh, that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God, and God created great whales and every living creature that moves, uh, that moveth, which uh, the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them. So he blessed the animals as well. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let uh, the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So notice here that God had blessed the animals. He blessed the, um, the, the human beings. Uh, he blessed the marriage, right? But when it comes to the days of creation, so he never blessed the first day. He didn't bless the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth. So nowhere in scripture does God ever say in the book of Genesis here, or anywhere else in scripture, that God bless a particular day. Instead, we find that by Genesis chapter 2, there's only one specific day of the creation week that God particularly blessed. And so Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 starts out, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. So remember, at, at this point, there's been no blessing of days at all. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So now not only is the seventh day itself blessed, but it's also sanctified or made holy. Because, here's why, in it he had rested from all his work, which, he, which God created and made. So there's a reason why God blessed that particular day of the week, whereas the other days of the week were not blessed. So just since Revelation points us uh, back to the creation week. And as we're looking at Revelation chapter 14 before, uh, particularly at verse 7, we're, we're pointed back to creation 
And the central issue in the book of Revelation, when we compare chapter 14 as well as chapter uh, 13, the central issue in the end of time is over the issue of worship. So as you read the, the mark about the mark of the beast in Revelation 13, the word worship is repeated consistently. Now here in Revelation 14, verse 7, the Bible says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Okay, so God's judgment has arrived. What do we do? And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. So now we're commanded to worship him. How do you worship God? Uh, Jesus pointed out, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we're pointed back to creation, and we're told to worship God. God specifically blessed the seventh day in particular, and sanctified or made holy the seventh day. And so by keeping the Sabbath, and worshiping God on the Sabbath, we are maintaining what God set in motion from the very beginning of time uh, as, as he commanded. So remember that the Sabbath is holy whether or not human beings choose to keep it. So even if nobody in the world keeps the Sabbath, the Sabbath is still holy because God blessed it in creation and sanctified it. And no text of scripture ever says that the Sabbath is no longer holy. So therefore, uh, since we've already established that the Sabbath is holy since creation, not since the time of the Jews, hundreds of years, actually probably even, yeah, well, at the very least, um, actually, yeah, we might be at a th maybe about a thousand years even before there was a Jew. Uh, long before Abraham, the Sabbath was made holy. All right, so at the very beginning of time, uh, you know, over a thousand years, the Sabbath was made holy because you figure Methuselah, would have been, uh, I think he lived to be about 963, if I remember correctly. Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong. 969, okay. 969 years uh, uh, Methuselah had lived. And then after that, you have uh, Noah's generation. Then you have um, the descendants leading down to Abraham. And then, of course, eventually Abraham's descendants became uh, the, the, uh, the Israelites, and, and, and which would include the Jews, right? So thousands of years before, I think about 2,000 years, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I'm stating it roughly, I'm not, that's not meant to be an exact number, um, but roughly 2,000 years before there was a Jew, the Sabbath was blessed, made holy, and sanctified uh, in, in the creation week. So if that's the case, then the Sabbath is holy regardless of what human beings choose to do with it or choose to do about it. Uh, so in keeping the Sabbath, we are simply honoring what God has already set in motion irregardless of what of, of the actions we choose to take. Uh, and so in Revelation 14, verse 7, the command to worship God points us back to the creation, setting back, taking us back to what was established in creation uh, and worshiping God in spirit and in truth, which would include the keeping of the Sabbath because God blessed it and sanctified it. If it was important to God, it should be important to us. So God created in six days, rested on the literal seventh day, and so the commandment has its origins in keeping and maintaining what was literally set in motion during the creation. The third angel's message alludes to the Sabbath because it uses the same language as the commandment as well as the, as the creation week uh, and therefore points us to the fourth commandment. So the wording of the, of the, of, of the statement here in Revelation 14, 7 mirrors that which the fourth commandment states, as I showed you before when I read Exodus chapter 20. So because those two statements basically... Uh, mirror one another. In, so in, in essence, Revelation 14, 7 is repeating uh, the very words of the commandment. Um, it's showing us that we too are to be keepers of the Sabbath. Um, and so therefore, it calls us to worship God, uh, which means that we must keep the literal seventh day Sabbath. And if that wasn't enough to convince you, notice what uh, after the, the third angel's message, so when we read Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, all the way down to uh, verse 12, the very last part of, of Revelation 14, verse 12, in the, th in the third angel's message, gives us this warning. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. So this text actually assumes that God's people who have patience, God's saints, will be keepers of his commandments and have the faith of Jesus. So from verse 7 all the way down to 12, it, the, the, it's, it, it, it assumes not only that the seventh day Sabbath is going to be kept, not only just not only the fourth commandment is going to be kept, uh, but also all of God's commandments are going to be kept by God's people who have the patience of the saints. 
There will be commandment breakers who receive the mark of the beast, and God will have his commandment keepers who receive the seal of God. So Revelation 14, the third angel's message, basically shows us the importance of the creation week because nobody's going to keep nobody's going to keep the Sabbath unless they believe in six literal days of creation. <clears throat> so the idea that the world was created over th over millions of years, um, you know, or that there weren't six literal days of creation, is yet another deception of the devil. Uh, just like he deceived Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, where he takes statements that God makes and then tries to apply them differently so as to lead people to disobedience. Uh, and people are doing the same thing with the Bible today, taking clear-cut, plain statements made by God and then trying to shift the meaning of those statements to apply it in a different way so as to lead people uh, in a different direction from the one that God had intended. So uh, Jesus uh, quoted the creation account. Paul quoted the creation account. Uh, many of the other disciples, many of the prophets quoted from the creation account. Uh, so when we look at all the evidence combined, it shows us that all of these people, including Jesus himself, believe in a literal six day of creation account. And so we should too. And uh, therefore there is a literal Sabbath um, that, um, that we keep in, in, uh, in, in uh, obedience to God's command. And what he said in motion in creation it's interesting that no other day in the bible receives the three designations that the sabbath receives in the book of genesis so again just to repeat what i talked about earlier first god rested on that day he blessed that day and he sanctified or made holy that day no other day of the week is ever throughout all of scripture from genesis to revelation no other uh, no other day of scripture uh no other day of the week is ever given um, those the, the combination of those three designations. No other day has been blessed. There's no other day in which God himself rested, and there's no other day that God himself sanctified or made holy specifically. No other day of the week. Um, so clearly, this points us back to creation as the foundation for the Sabbath. Without the creation, there can be no Sabbath. And so this shows us that in our time today, Satan will set up a counterfeit, uh, you know, as, as you read through Revelation 13 and, and you look at Daniel chapter 7, you'll see that Satan has a plan to set up a counterfeit in the place of God's Sabbath. Uh, so remember that the Bible says that this little horn power in Daniel chapter 7 will seek to change times and law, and they will be given into his hand for time, time, and the dividing of time. Uh, in fact, uh, there's actually a statement by uh, the Catholic Church uh, from, I think, um, the Catholic record, London, Ontario. Uh, 1923, if I'm not mistaken, where it says, and the transference of Sabbath observance to Sunday is proof positive of that of that fact. Actually, it said, um, wait, actually, I, I misquoted part of it. Uh, it said, um, uh, the church is above the Bible, and the transference of Sabbath observance to Sunday is proof positive of that fact. Uh, so, you know, there, they admit that Sunday is the mark of their authority in contradiction to the biblical Sabbath which God had set in motion. So the question that you have to ask yourself is, do human beings, does a church have the authority to change that which has been set in motion directly by God uh, of its own authority? Nowhere in scripture from Genesis to Revelation will you find that God authorized such a change. In fact, in the book of Daniel, he warned us that such a change was going to happen because the little horn power would think itself bold enough to do that. But uh, as we see in Revelation 14, those who have the patience of the saints are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So if one is to keep the commandments of God, that would include the fourth commandment, which commands us to remember what has already been made holy in the creation week. So the devil has a counterfeit even for the seventh day Sabbath. And as we've already seen in this uh, papal encyclical, um, they call the Sabbath the Jewish Sabbath, in other words, saying that it doesn't apply to Christians. And they said that um, uh, they wanted to encourage the world to observe a day of rest, uh, referring to Sunday, to alleviate global global warming. Uh, I want to just say hi, hi to everyone, and uh, thanks for thanks for tuning in and well, being with the program. Um, I just want to say, uh, since uh, John has talked a lot about the Sabbath, I'm, I'm like, uh, 
what would be the, uh, I I'm I'm gonna answer the question what what's the purpose of the Sabbath is it to have fun no I mean I don't like the word fun I just don't like that it's like frivolous so what the what I am purposeless so I think that what what the Sabbath could be is a restoring our God our our life into the in, into into uh, more like Christ to to worship Him to honor Him. To go to church, to pray more, to study more, to thank Him more—all um, these things are good to do on the Sabbath. And if your ox falls in the dish, if you if you get a flat tire on the way to church, yeah, of course, change your tire. But um, I think that uh, I, I I have a text here uh, in in uh, Mark chapter two, Mark chapter two, uh, verse twenty-seven. Uh, 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So it's not, the Sabbath isn't something, I get, out of that text, I get that the Sabbath isn't something to be trampled upon. It's not something to be desecrated on. It, it's, uh, uh, the Sabbath is wonderful. It's beautiful because you can lay, lay aside your work, lay aside your worries, lay aside your troubles of the week, and lay it, lay, lay it, lay it, lay it aside. And uh, really relax and relax and restore yourself. Don't don't go to Tokyo if you're in Michigan on the Sabbath because you know that would that would be that would be a, a taxing trip and it wouldn't be it wouldn't restore your name it wouldn't restore you into the image of God. Plus you would have to buy and sell and God doesn't want you to buy and sell on the Sabbath. You know you can look up that in Nehemiah if you need to see that. The end of Nehemiah there talks about don't buy on it. It makes the idea that don't buy or sell on the Sabbath. So um the it's to restore us. It's to give us. It's to give us uh, recreation. It really, mean, it, it really means to re, re, bring rec, re, recreation in our life. Uh, restore us into the image of God. Re, uh, reset our bodies and reset our minds and reset our hearts on God. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Um, another thing I would I would point out about that is that um, the Sabbath was made for man which means that it serves a purpose for humanity so the sabbath was if the sabbath was made for us that means that it's meant to be enjoyed by us it serves a purpose for us it's meant to be a blessing to us because everything think about it uh just as we said earlier if jesus loved his creation so much that he was willing to die for it right if god is willing to die for his creation then how can we say that he's not willing to give us everything what wouldn't he do for us if he's willing to die for us the only thing that it seems like he's that, like he's not willing to do for us is to change his principles, to change his his uh, his his um, uh, you know expectations or righteousness, right? Uh, but as far as he was willing to die for humanity to save us, in spite of the fact that we were in rebellion against him. So if he loves us that much, then we should trust him enough to know that if he commands us to keep the Sabbath, then the Sabbath is a blessing for us. And you know, I know that Andrew doesn't like to uh, use the term that the, the Sabbath is fun, but I think I I would I would uh, say that the Sabbath can be fun for us. So in other words, it's not for us to uh, to make our own fun, but rather in the presence of enjoying God, we can have fun in God's in in in, in getting to know God on a deeper level and enjoying spiritual growth. Uh, and so I don't want people to think that. Uh, Things like you know spiritual growth or, or or having a relationship with God has to be boring or taxing. No, that that can be very fun. Uh, you know, here at our at our house, uh, with my family, we have a great time on the Sabbath, uh, doing Bible games or or um, uh, sharing different stories. My daughter loves the Sabbath. Um, you know, so uh, the Sabbath doesn't need to be something that makes people miserable, but rather it can be something that we greatly enjoy, need, and are blessed by. Um, so. The Sabbath is something that, uh, you know, should be encouraged. Um, not something that people should shy away from or see as a burden because it's not a burden. Now, let's move on to the issue of creation and marriage. Uh, the author of, uh, of this week's lesson uh, said the following. The last decade has witnessed enormous changes in the way that society and governments define marriage. Many nations of the world have, have uh, approved same-sex marriages overturning previous laws that have protected the family structure that, com that uh, comprises at, at, its, at its center one man and one woman. This is an unprecedented development in many respects. 
uh, and it raises new questions about the institution of marriage, the relationship of the church and state, and the sanctity of marriage and the family as defined in scripture. Uh, so that's what uh, the new author, and I thought it was very bold of, uh, of, of the author of this lesson um, to make a statement like that, especially now where, uh, you know, once you, you come out and you say anything uh, about creation, uh, so if you defy evolution or if you defy, um, you know, anything that would go against the LGBT agenda, uh, then you are labeled as uh, somebody who is a bigot, uh, you know, and it can be a threat to your job and so forth. So I thought it was very, um, very bold of the author to come out and make the statement. The only thing that um, I would I would uh, disagree with is the line where he said it raises new questions about the institution of marriage. What questions? There's no question. Um, you know, as far as as far as the Bible is concerned, maybe people as individuals might have the question, but the Bible doesn't ask any questions. It makes statements pretty cl pretty cut and pretty clear. Um, so anyway, let's look at Genesis chapter uh, one, verse twenty six to twenty eight. Uh, and let's let's take a look at what God has to say about the institution of marriage in creation. So as he set it in motion. So Genesis chapter one, verse 26 to 28 says the following. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them ha have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So according to the creation account, only two human beings were made. Adam and Eve, right? And then we get a closer glimpse of how they were created in Genesis chapter 2, where it talks about Adam being formed from the, from the dust of the ground, God breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, man becoming a living being. Shortly after that, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a, help, uh, I will make a helper for him that is suitable for him. And so God put Adam to sleep, took out of his side the rib, and with that rib he made a woman and brought her unto the man, uh, to present you know, her to him and see what he was going to call her. And he, Adam said that you know, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So according to the Bible, the helper that was suitable for Adam, for the man, was Eve. And God only made, according to Genesis 1, uh, 28, only made, I'm sorry, uh, Genesis 1, uh, 27, only made two genders. So according to this, it says, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. I think uh, Pastor Mira had mentioned uh, last week during the uh, Sabbath school lesson that now they have like over a hundred something uh, gender pronouns for people these days. Uh, but according to scripture, there's only two genders um, where it says ma uh, male and female created he them. So if God only created male and female, then the question would then become, well, who created all the other genders? Uh, and that would, that would mean that human beings uh, created the other genders. Um, but God only created two, male and female. Um, and the other thing that's interesting here, it says in verse 28, that God blessed them, this male and female, and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Um, <clears throat> now let's take a look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. So we're going to go there for a minute. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. So the term helpmeet uh, actually means a helper that's suitable, a counterpart, so to speak. Uh, so the counterpart for Adam was what God created um, when Adam was put to sleep. And what's interesting is that Adam, when he sees Eve for the first time, remember, God never gave her a name. God never called her anything. God, uh, Adam calls her woman because she was taken out of man. Now, what's interesting is that there's a book called um, um, I Now Pronounce You Man and Woman Wife, uh, written by J.S. Henry. And what this author points out is that the Hebrew word for woman, Isha, is actually the same word for wife. So Adam, called, called uh, when, he, when, when Eve was brought to him, calls him, uh, sorry, calls her um, woman. Woman. 
right? For she was taken out of man. But that same word also means wife. So essentially, um, verse 22 tells us, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the, unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And now that same word, Isha, means both woman and wife. So she shall be called woman wife because she was taken out of man. Then in verse 24 and 25, the principle is set forth. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. So then you, you, there you can see all kinds of gender pronouns here. So you see like, you know, there's the father, the male, and then there's the mother. So the male, the man has to leave his male father and female mother and cleave unto his woman wife and they shall be one flesh. So the formula for marriage was set in motion in creation where Adam where, where, where um, Adam and Eve basically set the principle or set the stage for uh, what would take place in future generations and what God had set in motion to take place in, within future generations where the man was to leave, the male was to, to leave the father and mother and to cleave to his woman wife and they together were to become a united one flesh. And uh, then verse 25 points out, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So the Bible was very explicit and straightforward, leaving no question really about uh, what, how God defines marriage in the creation account, uh, as well as how, what God has set in motion from creation uh, down through history. And what's also interesting here is that the words that are used for um, man and woman are actually single. Uh, so, for example, you'll see here where it says, um, you know, uh, male and female created he them. So you have male singular, female singular. Uh, you have a man singular shall leave his father and mother, both singular, uh, and shall cleave unto his woman wife, singular. Uh, and they together, those each single is to become another single, meaning that they are united and become one flesh. So marriage requires that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This is the pattern that God himself had set in motion. And remember, God's, what's also interesting here is that God said, let us make man in our image. So all persons of the triune Godhead in loving relationship with each other now create the divinely instituted human relationship of marriage here on earth. So this was what was created by the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, the three of them agreed together and came together to make mankind in their image and to um, uh, create them in such a way that they uh, reflect uh, and resemble God because they were made in his image. And when they created the marriage institute, this is what they set in motion, that a man was to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they together would become one flesh. So scripture is unequivocal that this relationship is to take place between a man and a woman. I'm quoting from the from the from the book now, who's who themselves originate from their from their father and mother, also a man and a woman. This concept is further clarified in the instruction given to the earth to earth's first parents. Then God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So in the fifth commandment, children or offspring are to honor their father and their mother. This relationship cannot be fulfilled within any within anything but a heterosexual partnership, end quote. Just as it says, I'm actually going to read uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse three, verse 3 to 6. The Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. So right there in verse 4, Jesus himself. So you can't even argue, oh, that, that was in the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament. Things are different. Because Jesus himself said the exact same thing. He, Jesus himself said, in the beginning, he made them male and female. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, or that's why, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So this implies that the marriage relationship is holy. It's joined by God. 
set in motion at creation and exclusive to male and female only. We must support, and so therefore we must support and uphold the biblical uh, marriage while teaching and preaching um, that, you know, as with everything in creation, Satan has a counterfeit. Um, so you have biblical marriage, and then you have how marriage is defined by society. You have the biblical Sabbath, and you have the Roman church saying, hey, well, why don't we keep Sunday? You have the creation week, and then you have evolutionists saying, well, no, uh, it could be 6,000 years as opposed to six literal days. Uh, so everything in creation that God set in motion, um, Satan has a counterfeit for. So the Bible provides an unbroken link between the perfect creation, um, fall, the promised Messiah, and the final, and of course the final redemption. These major events become the basis of the theme of, of salvation history for the human race. Let me go ahead and uh, see. I think we got a comment coming in, so let me go ahead and grab it. God wanted God wanted uh, marriage to be pure and holy, and He wanted it us to keep God first in the marriage because when um when you set aside, when you set God aside in in marriage and that's when all sorts of things can come into play and so uh keep the purity of Jesus first in your marriage and then um and then and, and as the man is the head of the home I'm the head of the home so I lead, I lead under the head the true head which is Jesus so I I go I follow I I I practice what I preach and then my wife is gonna follow because she's humble enough. <laughs> it's funny that you uh, that you bring that up, actually, Andrew, because um, you know that's another thing I didn't mention before. Where in in creation, um, Adam Eve was given to Adam, so Adam was responsible for Eve. And uh, see, a lot of people will take that uh, the passages that deal with headship in a relationship and think that that means that we're like the boss, so to speak. Uh, the woman is subservient to us as if she's like some kind of slave. But remember that Eve was taken from Adam's side, not from under his feet that he could walk all over her. Uh, so the point was that they were a partnership, but within that partnership, there was a lead person and that lead was, was Adam. And so Adam uh, was, was, was made the, the head of the household uh, and especially after the fall, uh, you know, and, and so once that took place, um, that set the stage for how future relationships between men and women were to be carried out, uh, you know, after after um, the, the creation. In fact, uh, there's one writer, I think, that, that, that points out that before the fall, the relationship was, between Adam and Eve was so close and so harmonious that you wouldn't have even known that Adam was the head because they were always linked and connected together and functioned as a, as a unit. But after the fall, because of the division that sin created, uh, God particularly pronounced that Adam, uh, you know, as, as it says in Genesis chapter three, uh, your desire will be to your husband, but he will rule over you. So in uh, in 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 the um, Adam was always the head, but that became more like, um, I guess, pronounced uh, after the fall because of sin entering the picture. Uh, and so as a result of that. Uh, relationships going on into the future were supposed to have a head in the family because without the head you you, you can't really have a fu you can't have really a, a functioning unit um, but it's interesting today that uh, while God set in motion um, uh, the male being the head of the family uh, today you have feminism which either wants to reverse that or not acknowledge that um, where and you can understand why because I mean some people really abuse that role uh, and, and certainly taking advantage of, of, of what God set in motion and, and interpreted it to mean something that God never intended it to mean, uh, using it to, to, uh, to justify abuse. Um, however, um, what God set in motion was intended to be for the blessing of the family. And, um, you know, uh, that's something that is really scorned, uh, scorned at uh, today by, by uh, modern feminism and most people. Uh, you know, uh, even some pastors wouldn't even like to talk about that subject or the idea of, of male headship in a relationship. Yet uh, it's something that God put in place. So we can see so many different examples of how society today goes against the biblical trends. Uh, and even if you mention the biblical trend or, or what God said in motion, people get aggravated, upset, and it leads often to persecution. So thank you, Andrew, for that comment. So let's take a look at Genesis 131. The Bible says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So uh, based on what we see in verse uh, 31, everything that God had made in the six days, he said was very good. So notice that in the other uh, five days, everything was good. 
But by the time God finished and looked at everything that he made on the sixth day, it was very good. Uh, now looking at Genesis chapter 2, um, verse 15 to 17, the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. Now let's look at Genesis 3, 1 to 7, and we'll look at the temptation uh, that Eve went through. Uh, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, uh, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto, unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the, uh, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God, know, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them, the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So, sin marred creation. It was the lack of faith in what God had said. Uh, the idea that something could be obtained outside of what God had said. Uh, so Satan tempted uh, Eve with the idea that she could be more than God created her to be and that somehow God was withholding from her. And so the lack of faith in God's word led to disobedience. Satan caused Eve to distrust what God had said and gave her the idea that she could be more than what God created her to be. And so creation was made very good and only after the fact um, was sin introduced into the picture and uh, brought about the ruin, disease, famine, uh, and all the problems that we see in today's world today. So in, in, in today's world. Um, so from creation, we have the fall. And the fall, the idea that death was introduced into the human story, now creates a need for the cross. Because humanity was lost. They were doomed to die. And only through what Christ did on our behalf do we have any claim toward life. Uh, so human, human existence right now technically should already be extinct. Uh, but because of the cross, uh, we inherit everlasting life. Because God created us and gave us uh, the ability to choose, he, he made us free moral agents, we have you know, life and we have existence. When Adam and Eve fell in the garden, death was introduced into the human story, whereas it was not introduced prior. So Adam and Eve were never created to die. But because of sin, death entered the human story. And not just, be, not just Adam and Eve died, but every human being dies. And so death created a need for the cross so that we can have everlasting life. So that alone shows you why evolution cannot harmonize with the gospel. Because the gospel is based on the fact that God created all things to live forever. Sin interrupted and marred the human story. And so therefore there was a need for the cross to reverse the curse of death uh, that uh, entered the human story because of sin. So because of sin, there is death, and every human being, everything on earth dies. Uh, but yet the cross allows us to inherit everlasting life. So without the creation story and the fall, there's no need for the cross. The cross is based on and rooted and grounded in the creation and the fall. And without those two things, there's no need for Jesus to go to the cross at all. So the cross assumes that the creation account and the, uh, and the fall account uh, from Genesis 1 to 3 is correct. Now, if you try to throw human evolution in there and you say, well, Adam and Eve eventually came after thousands and thousands of years, uh, and, that human, and that animals are, were going through, uh, before Adam and Eve were, create, were, were, uh, were, were, were on the scene, animals were going through um, thousands of years or millions of years or billions of years of evolutionary process or natural selection, and they were dying, and uh, some were dying, and others were, uh, 
were continuing to, to, to produce offspring. And then uh, through natural selection, some were dying off, whereas others were continuing on until we have what we have today. Um, then the problem with that is that if you have death taking place be, uh, in favor of uh, natural selection, then that means that death was involved in the story uh, prior to sin. Uh, whereas the Bible says that everything was created perfect. There was no sin and there was no death. And so death was only introduced after sin. So the two ideas can't square together. Uh, either you believe in evolution in which there's always been death. So evolution actually puts death in the human story and naturalizes that which is not natural. Hum uh, evolution naturalizes death because in order to have natural selection, only the strong survive, only the most fit continue on and continue to produce offspring, uh, you know, and, and, and move forward. Um, and so you have this process of death and, and nature choosing what's going to survive and what's going to populate, right? Uh, and so you have to have death in order for evolution to work. But according to the Bible, there was no death in the Garden of Eden or when God first created the world. There was no death. And so death only entered the picture when sin entered the picture. So prior to Adam and Eve, there was no death. Prior to sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, there was no death. Adam and Eve themselves were created to live forever. So there is no trial and error. There is no natural selection, according to the Bible. Death enters the human story after sin, whereas uh, with evolutionary thought or theory, death is always in the story. So right there, it shows you that those two ideas, those two concepts, those two, theory, those two um, uh, radical ideas about how the world uh, came into being are very different and they do not sync with each other. Either you believe the biblical account or you believe this other account. Um, but then again, the problem is that if you, if you, if you want to go with evolutionary theory, um, you can keep trying to say such and such evolved from such and such, and you can keep going back and back and back, but eventually you will wind, you will wind up at the single cell organisms and where do they evolve from? Something cannot evolve from nothing. And Darwin himself admitted that his theory would break down if you could show something to be irreducibly complex. So at the moment you can't break something down into something lesser, evolutionary theory ceases um, to, uh, to, be, to be a viable option. Now, on the other hand, the Bible explains how something can come from nothing. God is from everlasting and he will be too, too everlasting. And God created and brought everything into being from nothing. In the beginning, God created. And from there, all things were created to live forever. But sin entered the picture and brought the curse of death. Paul seems to agree with this, as we see in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Let's go there and take a look at his words. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So in other words, Paul's saying here, hey, the reason why death entered into the human story was because of sin. Because one man sinned, sin entered into the world. And because of sin entering into the world, death was brought into the world. Uh, and so because of that, death passes upon all human beings. Why? Because every human being is, is guilty of sin. As Paul said elsewhere, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They have all together uh, become unprofitable. Um, and there's actually another passage too that just came to mind uh, where Paul also says, there is none righteous. No, not one. So because there is none righteous, um, when there's sin, there is death. And we can go to Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 23, where Paul makes the same point even clearer. He says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So because sin entered into the picture, death entered into the picture, because sin brings death. And because all human beings have sinned, death um, is something that we all go through, we all experience. Um, I think the psalmist says uh, we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So every human being is born with a propensity towards sin. 
So Paul confirms the Genesis account, pointing out that because Adam sinned, uh, because of Adam, sin entered the, into the world and death through sin. So our condition results from what happened in the fall and how uh, death was introduced to our world. Jesus reverses the death and condemnation, uh, allowing us to obtain everlasting life. So later biblical writers actually confirmed earlier biblical statements like in the book of Genesis and provided additional insights showing us that they too believed in a literal creation account and they believed in the book of Genesis as historical fact. Whereas evolutionary perspective would have death present for millions of years prior to humanity um, and, and if, 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 if death is not related to sin then, uh, the wages, then the wages of sin is not death. So in other words, um, if de death has always been in the picture, then sin cannot possibly be the cause of death, and therefore Jesus would not have needed to go to the cross. Now, according to the Bible, we get a completely different story that contradicts evolutionary theory. Uh, and it points out that Christ would have uh, that, that Christ needed to die for us because it was the only way to save us from sin, which results in death, and that sin or death, rather, is a direct result of sin. So the reason why death is in our world, uh, whereas it's not in the unfallen worlds, uh, the reason why death is in the human story and why it's in our world is because of sin. So the creation, the fall, and the cross are inextricably linked. Uh, the first Adam is tied to the last Adam. So Adam is the first Adam, and Jesus Christ is the second Adam that reversed uh, the, the death curse um, and, and so even though in Adam, we all inherit death, uh, in Christ Jesus, we all uh, can inherit everlasting life. And so the creation, and of course the, the story of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, is essential to a biblical worldview and an understanding of the gospel uh, and an understanding of, of, uh, of, of um, salvation. Okay. Uh, so we've run out of time. Uh, there's a lot more that we could talk about with regard to these subjects. Uh, so let's cl close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, the truth, Lord, and for how you have made the truth so plain in the scripture. Guide us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to accept this truth and to understand uh, that you have created all things and set all things in motion according with your purpose and according with your, in, in accordance with your will. Guide us, Lord, and be with those who will hear these uh, words and uh, maybe even be offended or maybe be... Um, uh, angered uh, by, by some of the things that were said here um, because they may have a view that goes out of harmony or out of sync with what you have said in your word. Help us, Lord, to be humble, to accept your will and not to um, give in to the counterfeits. Help us, Father, to believe and accept the truth and to have a biblical worldview. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great week.